Hi there, and welcome to the Grief and Rebirth podcast. I'm your host, author and trauma survivor, Irene Weinberg, here to encourage you wherever you are in your healing journey. In each episode, I chat with incredible grief and trauma specialists, healers, mediums, and celebs, as well as remarkable people who have inspiring healing stories to share. If you're looking for a podcast that's both uplifting and inspiring, you've found it. Let us help you find your joy in life. Hi, everyone. I hope this finds each of you so very well. I'm speaking to you from my studio in West Orange, New Jersey, and I could not be more delighted to have the pleasure of interviewing Janine Sarna Jones, a certified professional organizer and certified senior move manager whose passion lies in helping clients reduce stress during life transitions, creating customized solutions and managing complex projects to completion through her company, Organize Me, Inc. After Janine graduated from Stanford University, she worked as a photographer and photo archivist at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. When she originally founded Organize Me, she primarily offered residential hands-on organizing as a slow as a solo organizer. Today, Janine's company has a concierge-style team approach, providing services including move management and unpacking services, estate clearance, project management, and organizing for both homes and offices. Janine's dedication to her work has been recognized through features in print, radio, and podcast, as well as her role as a member of the Parenting Magazine's Mom Squad. And she has served in leadership roles within the National Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals and the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers. I'm looking forward to talking with Janine, who will be speaking to us today from New York City about the connection between grief and clutter, the challenge dealing with the possessions of a loved one while mourning, the loss, her mission to mitigate the stress inherent in the transitions we all face, how she helps both seniors and growing families to get organized, and more for what is surely going to be an enlightening interview filled with information and insights we can all use. Hi, Janine. A warm welcome to Grief and Rebirth podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you, Irene. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to have you here. I think we're going to help a lot of people with this, Janine, because as a person who's moved a lot in her life, it can be one of the most upsetting, devastating, confusing, uh, you name it, whatever it can trigger, it triggers. <laughs> and especially, and especially if you're grieving and you're, mm-hmm. and, and you're dealing with your loved one and their possessions and all the things, it can be very, very, very hard. So I know someone like you has got to be a wonderful blessing and an asset to have when you're like overwhelmed with everything going on. Right. So let's start by getting everyone to know who you, who you were from the beginning. So (laughs) could you tell us about your childhood and were you known to have a gift for organizing things at that time? Um, Well, I grew up in, in California until I had to move to New York at nine with my family. And, but as a child, I remember it, for me, it was really all about the process of things. So I really enjoyed playing library. So all of my books had stamps in them. (laughs) I was an avid, I've always been an avid reader. Um, And as a child, I would at five, I would go to the library on my own, walk there and walk back with an armful of books. Oh, your parents loved you. You kept busy. Oh, yeah. I my mother said recently, uh, you know, I know how independent you are. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I've been that way my entire life. Um, but I I really love, you know, finding a way to escape the world, you know, because you can just go into a book and, and it's an amazing experience to experience another world. Absolutely. But I also Absolutely. loved the library because <laughs> you would bring your books and there was this whole process and then books would go on the shelf after you return them. <laughs> You know, it would seem like a library is the epitome of uh, organizing. On some <laughs> level, absolutely. But it was later when 
I was, um, you know, as a teenager, I really was interested in theater. I, I wanted to understand what the what went on behind the scenes. And my first um, volunteer project was as an assistant stage manager oh. and is really where I discovered the process it's all because theater is all about process. There might be spit and glue to, you know, hang something up or fix a costume or something like that. But it brings people out of themselves and into this other world with the characters and the set and everything is, you know, it's like a whole other world. But I love being a stage manager uh, later. I mean, up until I met my husband, I that's how I met him. I was stage, man stage managing a show at a Lower East Side Theater and it was, so it brought me was he in the audience or was he in the crew? It was actually, we were having a gala performance and he was actually helping. He was going to play drums with the, we had the director and a couple of guys in the show were going to um, have like a little band. <laughs> and so he joined <laughs> the, them and um, that's how I met him. And that was the beginning of the story. Yeah. So, right. So I know that a lot of what you do was inspired by the loss of your aunt Sue. Not only was it inspired by her, but she also taught you about grief and the process of sorting possessions of a loved one. So did this happen before, while you were still doing the stage work or did this happen after? Well, I did stage management on the side of what working at the museum and I wasn't, I kind of stopped doing it because, you know, once you have a love in your life, <laughs> it's, it's hard to find time, you know, for all the extracurriculars that I um, am known to involve myself with. But my, my aunt Sue is a big part of my life. I'll tell you that she, as a child, when I moved to New York, she would take me to Broadway shows. I would spend weekends with her oh, wow. and she really tried to show like the great aspects of New York City and all the things that we have available here to us. And, you know, I loved her deeply. Um, and later on, when I had my daughter and left the museum soon after, I think she was about five, six months old, um, I, I was really grateful to have Sue in my life because she immediately just you know, love my daughter so much. It was such a loving and amazing experience to have somebody who would say, I think you need to go out. I want to take care of her. Oh, how wonderful. <laughs> oh my gosh. What a blessing. Yes. And she, you know, so my daughter got this great opportunity to do a lot of the things that Sue had taken me to do when I was a child. And it was, and they had a really special relationship. So um, once she died, so how old was your daughter when Aunt Sue died? Unfortunately, it was when she was eight. So she didn't have her long enough. But when she died, it was, she was getting ready to move out of the apartment that she was living in. And she was going to put things in storage and go live with a friend in Vermont. And when she died, it was such a shock. It was unbelievable. My parents and myself and my husband and my daughter, we were all in California celebrating my mother-in-law's birthday. And, and I got a phone call. And to make a long story short, <laughs> I'll just tell you this. My uncle decided to go ahead because she had already scheduled a move. He had said, okay, well, the guy should, the mover should come. They should pack up and put everything in storage. And coincidentally, my aunt Sue had scheduled the mover that I work with a lot. Um, and I, I basically knew that we were going to have to go through all of her possessions and go through all of these boxes. And my mother said, so yeah, hard. it was so hard. And my mother said, um, well, I'd ask the mover. I said, please tell the guys that this is my aunt and please ask them to do the best that they can to label the boxes with the contents as best they can. And so my mother said to me, can't we just look at the labels on the boxes and then decide what which boxes we're going to get rid of. And, and I said, no, I said, we have to go through every single box, look at every single item, because we have to make decisions about every single thing that is in storage. And it was, I can tell you what I learned. You must have cried while you were unearthing certain things. Well, you know, by the time we started doing it and the mover that I worked with, uh, it's upstairs, downstairs moving here 
based in New York and I have a very close relationship with the owner. I, it was, I'm not very um, emotive when it comes through going through the stuff of somebody that's passed away. I think it's hard, if, you know, I had already cried like a river of tears and it was almost, do you know that feeling when you've cried and you've cried, you almost feel like you have nothing left, like you're empty. And even if you wanted to cry, there's it's like nothing no, in there anymore. Exactly. Cause you can't there's no way to replenish it's almost like you've, you've <laughs> cried an aquifer you know and it's there's nothing left and I I had done a lot of crying and by the point of going through my aunt's things with my mother we went every week together and the mover sent one of his guys to help us get the boxes and um, we ended up going through making I took pictures for the family so you know people if they there were things that they wanted they could pick them up we could have them delivered at the end but it was all these things that you know like her life was in these boxes and there were some things my mom found things that she from her childhood that my aunt had that she didn't even realize they still existed you know so it was what I learned is that we imbue the things in our life with our own spirit and the things that we we hold on to it says a lot about who we are as people but it was also the process of going through and making choices and trying to find a way to share with the family things that, that would help them remember her was it was a really it was a deep process and I had done a few of these projects with other with clients but it never I never really understood how hard it was I mean I I intellectually I knew but when I had to face it myself it was wow this is this I is hard it. Yeah. so it gives you an extra it gives you a lot of dollops of compassion when you're working with people like this because you understand what they're going through so what inspired your mission to mitigate the stress inherent in the transitions we face and what was your inspiration for the name of your company organize me well first I don't like to be stressed <laughs> <laughs> I can I can I can I can lift a glass of wine to that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm very, I'm a very even keeled person. And I know that my superpower is to be able to cross over your threshold and calm you down because I, I understand what you're trying to achieve. I often will come to somebody and they're just like, Oh my God, I, I should I show you around? Should I do this? Should I do that? And, and I say, no, wait, no, let's sit down for a minute. And sometimes I hold their hands and I say, say, why don't we take a few deep breaths together and then we can begin. That's beautiful. That's because beautiful. I, I know that just the physical touch from another person who sees you, and that's really the gift that I'm giving somebody who's completely stressed out is to be seen and to be heard and to be understood. Those are very important qualities that we can as individuals share with another person, right? And in this world today, it's in short supply, which makes someone like you even more precious because so many people, it's like they see each other as a, just a transaction. Yeah. They don't see the person behind what's going on. And you see it all the time. You know, you call, you call customer service and they've got a script and you're yes. going through something and they don't care. It's just <laughs> that they want you to tell them at the end, tell the company that they did a good job. Mm -hmm. And right. And but they didn't really relate to what you were trying to say to them. Exactly. Right. It was a, it was a, a checklist. So how? why did you decide to transition your business from a solo operation to well, a team? I'll so you were growing? No, to, yeah. Well, I have to explain the reason why the company is called Organize Me is because when people found out that I was uh, helping people and organizing them, they would say, oh gosh, I wish I had somebody who could organize me. And I heard it over and over and over again. And I thought, okay, well, I guess that's the right name for this company so that people can. And at the beginning, I was just an organizer. I wasn't, I, you know, people would tell me sometimes you're more than just an organizer. You know, it's beyond that. And I would, I didn't really, I couldn't quite connect that to my own personal personal view of what I was doing. But I transitioned after 10 years, I could, I hit a ceiling of how much money I could make. But it was, it was the right thing to do at the time. My daughter was young. I wanted to be class mom. I wanted to go on all the school trips. So I had a very 
limited schedule, you know, based upon my child. And I ended up realizing that I had hit a level of revenue that was not sustainable in New York City. <laughs> and my, this big revelation came with a need to realize that I needed to do something different. And the thing is, and this is true, I am completely unemployable. <laughs> <laughs> I could never go and get a job and work for somebody else because I'm always telling the person that I work with what's wrong and how we can improve it. I'm all about let's improve it, make it better, make it more efficient, all of that. So that's definitely not something that a boss would want to hear. And, and I am a natural leader. So I had to go back to the drawing board, figure out what Organize Me was going to be. And I realized the projects that I really loved were the ones that had a beginning, a middle and an end. And the and the projects that where I had to pull in colleagues to help me complete something because it was too complicated or big for me to do by myself. So that's how I transitioned. And in that first couple of years, transitioning to a team-based business, the revenue just blew up and I became a six-figure business. And I was so proud of myself and I loved my I love my team and I appreciate them so much because I want to share the wealth with everyone. And they appreciate you, I'm sure. And would you say that the biggest challenge involved with dealing with the possessions of a loved one while mourning a loss is the emotional component or is there more? I think there's a couple of things. I mean, in some cases, um, there is there is definitely an emotional component, whether it's the loss of that person and feeling that loss or anger in some cases. But I think the there's a process to it. And a lot of people don't understand how they can make it easier for themselves. Um, I think when somebody passes away, you often, the family goes in and they start sorting things and taking things <laughs> out of closets and, you know, just, but they don't do it in a way that's methodical because they're, they're just consumed. They're emotional. Overwhelmed by, I want that pin. No, you're not getting that pin. Da, 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 da. You know, I've actually had the opposite experience where people are like, oh, do you want that? Or they'll put notes on things and, and, and then they'll say, oh, but if you want it, you can have it. I'll take oh, wow. the thing, you know, I've, and I think it, maybe it's the kind of client that I attract. I'm not sure, but I've mostly had families who really didn't want to. And honestly, in most cases, I would say the vast majority, they don't want anything. Oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. They don't want, they may want, you know, a few little things, maybe some photos, but they really don't want anything. They don't want furniture. They don't want art. They don't, they don't want. Any so you know how to dispose of these things, I guess, or what to do, but it must be really hard when you see someone's life and it's getting thrown in the trash or. Well, we try very hard. I mean, we try to be sustainable. You know, we, we care about the environment. So we um, actually, we work and partner with companies that are buyers. So sometimes when you have some nice things, it's can I either go to auction or buyers can come in and take it and then you don't have to pay for them to, to move it out. Um, we've also, we also partnered a lot with Junk Luggers of New York, which they have a resale shop in Long Island City. So they try to sell things and the proceeds from that, a pr percentage of the profit Let's go to goes to Habitat for Humanity. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. And they they really do try not to put things into the into a landfill. So um we we like we like opportunities to donate as much as possible. Like even if linens and towels and things like that, we take them to the ASPCA so that they can be used for the animals. Um, but it's not it's not it's not what you would think. I mean people don't I don't see people necessarily fighting over things. And I also when they don't want things we try our best to find a place for those things. That's yeah. wonderful. That's really wonderful. Is there a connection between grief and clutter? Absolutely. 100%. There have been over the years, I've met so many people when, you know, a loved one passed away, they would take all of their furniture and put it into their home that already had all the furniture that they needed. And they would, or they would have things that they just couldn't let go of because, and I would have to like kind of counsel them through the process of understanding that their loved one was not in the object. It wasn't, you know, their soul 
soul was not inside of it. And all of that stuff didn't represent them as well as it did their relationship with that person. It, the heart, yeah. The heart part, yeah. And how they touched them, what effect they had on them. That was the thing that was really important, not the stuff. And so there were many, many times when people needed to, um, time to process the fact that the furniture that they had collected, they didn't have room for it. They were living in clutter or they were overwhelmed by the volume of what they had only because they didn't, they felt like they were throwing away the person. So I would say things like, well, take a picture, have an album, then you can flip through and look at the things that this person owned. You don't have to have the object itself. You're also a counselor in a way. When you, when you, with your services, you really help people to um, clear, um, get clear on what's important in their grief and, and what's in, and, and uh, uh, kind of take away perhaps the guilt of, oh my God, I got rid of this piece of furniture. Does that mean I'm a bad person? La, 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 you know, which is great. And, and I know this is connected to of my next question because you have a very uplifting story about helping a woman who needed help finding a will in mm -hmm. her cousin's apartment. You want to share that with our with our grief and rebirth audience? It's a yeah, great story. Yeah, exactly. It's a pair of sisters. Their cousin had died in her apartment and this is in Queens. And there's the Queens Public Authority. They come over, they, when somebody dies and they don't have a loved one that steps forward, they basically take over ownership over the process and they search for a will. There was a New York Times article about an example of this, and it was so exactly like what we experienced. And they have investigators who go and look through the apartment. I was told several times, there's no will here. And I <laughs> couldn't, I, the cousins, the sisters, they said, we know that there's a will. Our father talked about it. You, you know, we never saw it ourselves, but we knew that she absolutely 100% had a will because our father had helped her get it together. Oh, wow. And and they basically said, um, if you can just help us find this will, we would be so grateful. We know it's somewhere in the apartment. And unfortunately, the apartment was pretty rough. Let me put it that way. And... And if, uh, if they didn't find the will, then agencies or whatever would have their way with her things as opposed to what she wanted. The public authority would take a big chunk of her estate, a big chunk. So after being told several times <laughs> that there was no will, um, I took a team, uh, four people from my team to go through and search the apartment. And I gave them very clear instructions. And the sisters came too because they wanted to help. I said, just start in one corner and just methodically go through every single thing look for something that looks like a will and I had a meeting with another client so I left and during that meeting I kept getting my phone was blowing up <laughs> 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 and it was like literally probably an hour after they had started, maybe hour, hour and a half. And I got a text that said, we found the will. <laughs> <laughs> and it was in a, not a necessarily logical place, but we found it because it was in a Ziploc baggie behind a cushion in her favorite chair. And that was such, it was so amazing. But then, and meanwhile, I think the investigator who had to be there while we were in the apartment he was furious <laughs> <laughs> He should took away his, his, uh, yes. Well, also his, him, his, uh, professional, I mean, he was professional about it, but he was clearly upset because he had said so many times that there was no will. Then they asked us to go back and find some specific financial papers. So I sent a couple of people to do some searching and they found another copy of the will. Wow. So, you know, that's why I call uh, this blog post where there's a will, there's a way it's, it maybe you're not looking in the places where people, you know, care about something, wh where they would put it. It doesn't make any logical sense to you, but it made sense to her. And I mean, there've been so many times when we found money, you know, stacks of cash because somebody put it in a really odd place. But it they didn't want them. anyone to find it, but they didn't realize <laughs> that one day people really wouldn't be able to find it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so there's things like that that people do when you're clearing an estate that 
it's very, it's so interesting, but I love the fact that my team found that will in, in less than two hours, absolutely no time at all. You know, I'm getting that your particular temperament is so suited for what you do because you've got people with emotion all around you. And the fact that you are so even with your clients and with an administrator who's ego is bruised because he wasn't proved right or whatever is going on. And and you and, and the way you, you sound like a no drama mama, which is probably <laughs> a very good thing. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. I'm, not, I'm not really I love theater, but I don't like drama. <laughs> you don't like personal drama. So <laughs> let me ask you, but you have a I know you have a process for helping seniors right size, which I'm sure there are a lot of people listening to this have seniors in their lives who may want to move or transition or whatever. And then you also have a process for helping growing families get organized. And we have many people in our audience with growing families. So could you tell everyone how you can help each one of them, depending on their situation, what you do? Yeah. So for seniors, it, it kind of depends on where, where they, if they want to live in their home, but make it safe or feel less cluttered, then we go and we help them identify the things that are really important to them and make them accessible. And if they are, they're prepared to let go of other things, we're happy to go through the process of, you know, finding the right way to let go of these items, whether it's to sell them or to auction them off or to donate them. We recently helped a woman whose husband had passed away and she wanted to turn her apartment into her, a place that reflected her and what was interesting to her because her husband had been an artist and he had basically filled the apartment with his work. And so everywhere she turned, she just saw him. So we basically helped her downsize and create a space that was open and lighter and all of her husband's work was put into a room. And I think sometime in the next couple of weeks, we're going to start working with her on clearing that room so that she can recreate it into something, maybe an office for herself or a guest room or something like that. And maybe choose a piece or two to incorporate, but she doesn't have to keep everything. Exactly. Right. I mean, I went through the same thing because I'm widowed and I also had to um, transition into a smaller space. Yeah. And uh, I did a lot of that. I really understand how important that is, you know, because there's a part of you that needs to move on from the loss. And there's another part of you that that's such a piece of who you are and your memory. So it's a, it's a real, it's kind of a balancing act of what you it keep is. and what you allow to go, right? Absolutely. I I agree with that 100 percent Right. But, so for growing families, it's usually they're upsizing because they're, you know, having babies and right. It's the opposite of the downsizing. This is upsizing. Yes, exactly. So they're like establishing what's gonna be going on for decades. And for those families, it's like, first of all, <laughs> one of the things <laughs> I often have to say is I think maybe it's a good idea to do some swapping out with the toys because children have so much stuff. I mean, the amount of toys and stuffed animals that kids have, it's almost obscene. And I know that the kids would be happy with a cardboard box or the, or the box that something came in more than anything. But if you if you're trying to help your child understand the process of letting go of some things as they get older, you have to do it with them and you have to tell them, well, you have a lot. Maybe there's some things that you can share with another child. Why don't you pick out your favorite and then think about who you could give some things to. That's beautiful. That doesn't have as much as you. So I've worked with some families on that, you know, with their children, but also helping them move to a new space and kind of recreate um you know, the systems that change because you have a child, you know, create places where kids can hang up their coats, you know, teach them independence or where they can go and get their own plate and bowl and fork and, you know, things like that. It's, it's really fun to- You make help. people's lives run more smoothly. That's the idea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a wonderful idea. And also you're filling in a blank to me because not everybody in their overwhelm is thinking about, well, how is this a, a learning lesson for my child about giving- about sharing and and giving things away that they're not using, but someone some other child can use it. So you're also providing a life lesson, I think, yeah. that people don't often think about. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. And so that's wonderful. So let's talk about all the things that you do so beautifully um, to help people. You have professional organizing, you have move management, you have a state clearance. You, I'll tell you what it is. It's easier if I just tell you. Go. There, there, 
different aspects of what we do. Everything, there's like an overarching family transitions. Um, I think that's the best way to say it. It's like all kinds of family transitions from literally birth to death. So we can help families who have new children and, or, you know, they have a baby, help them set up a nursery all the way to an older person who's passed away and the family needs help clearing out that home or they're going to sell it or whatever. But we we also move people a lot. So the move management piece is one of the biggest pieces because you can have people upsizing and other people downsizing to move into assisted living or a senior community where there isn't as much space as where they came from. So helping people identify what's important and make a plan for where it's going to live in their new space is a big piece of what we do. And move management is what we love to help people with because that is one of the most stressful experiences. It people. Is. So estate clearance is another big piece of what we do. And that's really to support the family or the executor deal with the stuff that's left behind and make it possible for whatever's going to happen to that home, make it happen. <laughs> it's just like give it to the real estate broker, empty, painted, whatever they want. Um, or if we have to bring in a stager to stage, we'll do that too. And then finally, people who just want to get organized, if somebody just feels like their house is not working for them, we can help them create systems within the house so that they can maintain it their, themselves. And sometimes that includes labeling, you know, drawers or boxes or uh, purchasing containers so that things have a home. That's fun to do too. So now if so someone wants to move to a different that. state, you can you do that? I mean, you're, are your Absolutely. services limited? limited to like New York City or they go everywhere? Well, we work in New York City in the tri-state area. So, we so tri-state is New Jersey, Connecticut? Northern New Jersey, southern part of Connecticut, Westchester, Long Island, out to the, you know, to Montauk. And we are willing to travel. I, in, before the pandemic, I used to go to the other end with a team member and I would assemble a local team wherever I went. Um, we haven't had to do that because I now partner with Holly on the other end um, so that it makes it easier and we can just keep on working here. And um, if people- So you up, have people on the other end. So if they're moving like to another state or something out of the tri-state area, you right. have other people on the other end who can also help them when they arrive at their destination. Yes. And that's the beauty of that is that I have been very active in my association with NAPO and I am a NAPO is let everyone know Na national. The national Association of Productivity and Organizing Professionals. And you can go to NAPO napo.net and find an organizer near you. If you want somebody like me near you, you can find somebody there or you can go to nasm, n a s m m org and you can find somebody like me in your area. Now, if someone wants to find someone like you and they say, well, I don't know if I need her to actually come. I'd like to have a Zoom meeting and discuss what I've got going on. Do you do stuff like that also? Absolutely. Remotely and all that kind of thing. So, you know, if your presence isn't needed, but your guidance is needed, mm -hmm. you can do that for people also, right? Absolutely. I mean, sometimes it's funny. Um, I think, you know, people of your generation, they're also used to doing things themselves. <laughs> it's like, do you remember in the 70s where you had all these manuals about how to do this, how to right. do this? And most of the people that I know that are in their 70s, they like rebuilt a car engine, you know, from an instruction manual. Um, that so wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I my parents definitely did it. So <laughs> I so I find that there's this like feeling that I have to do it myself and some that are totally capable of doing it themselves. And I'm happy to support them to do it themselves because there is such a, an amazing thing when you identify your own self-efficacy and you feel good about your accomplishment. Like, I love that. So I can definitely help people who just need some guidance and some ideas on how to move forward. You empower them. You empower them and you, and you help them to be more efficient with what they want 
want to do. Do you have anything special to offer to our Grief for Me Birth podcast audience today? Yes, I do. It may not apply to everybody, but um, my one of the things that we put together uh, for podcasts, especially when it had to do with grief or estate clearance or anything like that, is a checklist for people who need to clear the stuff. It kind of uh, gives you some instructions on how you can take a beat and you don't have to make decisions right away. Um, and But these are some of the most important things to think about as you're going through the process of letting go of that loved one's possession. Right. So we'll provide a link to that when yeah. we release this interview, which will be so helpful to many people, I'm sure. I hope and, so. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, you know, so many people that I know are, not, I happen to be an organized person, but I know many people are not. And when they come into my home, they'll say, wow, I admire how you've got everything you know but not everybody has that gene <laughs> organization <laughs> and yeah, i still the, needed help when i when i was in transition <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah, it's I, one of the best things that i always tell people you know when you ask for help you know and I, there have been times when i've had to ask for help but when you ask for help it's it's probably one of the bravest things that you can do as a human being it's a life lesson yeah. it really is a life lesson because so many of us i think are brought up to give to others mm -hmm. and to always be serving and sometimes you really need someone to help you and to allow that into your life, Absolutely. to allow that person to give you that gift of their service and help yes. is, is another aspect of uh, life. Uh, it's, I had to learn that when I, when my husband died, I had to learn that to, there were people, I was, I had operations and I had different things going on and it was a big lesson for me, exactly what you're saying. I was used to doing everything, being very competent. And suddenly I really needed people to help me. Mm -hmm. And they used to say to me, Irene, don't feel guilty. It's a gift you're giving me because I love you and I want to help, Yeah, you know? So speaking of that, why do you believe that offering to help is a key to healing yourself? Because it's very simple. When you, uh, during the, I'll give you a story. I think this helped. Uh, during the pandemic, um, at the very beginning of it, I lost a friend who I had known since I was, since I moved to New York and somebody that I really cared for. And, um, and I went to my, I, I couldn't believe that he had passed away. It was insane. He's my age. I thought it was crazy. And, um, I texted him and said, somebody just called me and told me that you're dead. You've got to be kidding. <laughs> like, can you please like, get back to me? So I wrote this like ridiculous text message because I couldn't believe it. And, you know, I was in deep, deep grief after it was probably about six weeks while everybody else is doing sourdough starters and things like that. I just was like bereft. And also because I had no way to connect to the people that cared about him. It like, didn't give you closure with him either because it None. came as such a shock you didn't have a chance to say anything exactly right express yeah. yourself about him connect with him that yeah. one more time yeah so that was really horrible but I realized I couldn't be in the state of grief forever and I thought okay the best way for me to get out of it is to offer some help to somebody else who needs it and so I put on zoom um, I did a little video on zoom just saying I'm offering my services for free we we can just have a video chat. And if you have a challenge, I'd love to help you. Because I figured, what was the point? If I closed myself off, then I wouldn't be able to come out of this hole that I found myself in. And, you know, I cried my river of tears. And the best thing I could do was to give somebody else an opportunity to change something that wasn't working for them. It was also a wonderful way to honor his memory. Because a lot of people, you know, they'll say, can I make a donation to something? Well, you donated in your way to people and that was a beautiful way to honor yeah honor your relationship with them that's lovely and what is janine's personal tip for finding joy in life well i think you have to i love it when you have a friend who just makes you laugh i think that laughter finding i find joy in connecting with people who just are filled with positivity and so i i think that's the best way to find joy i'm like i'm so blessed i have an amazing 
amazing team that I love to be with. I have a lot of joy when I can support them to do the work that we do for all these people. I Joy is in your connection with other people that brings positive vibes and energy to every day. That's, that's, that's beautiful. I, I can totally relate to what you say. Janine, I have to say that I have moved and transitioned many times in my life. So I fully <laughs> agree from personal experience that what you do about moving, which is so stressful, even when it promises welcome change is very needed because whether it's a move to a person's dream home or a first apartment, a senior needing to downsize or facing the challenge dealing with the possessions of a loved one while mourning that loss, the tasks, decisions, and details often feel very overwhelming. And I can also relate to your feeling of stepping into the light when you're helping others the way you do. How wonderful that your supportive and resourceful services can provide a much needed healing bridge to those immersed in grief and other life transitions. Thank you from my heart for what you do to bring light into the lives of others and for this enlightening, informative, and uplifting interview. And here's a loving reminder, everyone, that you can see the show notes and all Grief and Rebirth podcast episodes on IreneWeinberg.com, on social at, at Irene S. Weinberg, on Instagram, Facebook, and wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. As I like to say, to be continued. Thank you so much, Janine. Thank you. Thank you so so much. It was so lovely to, to speak with you. It's I, This is really, and vice versa. And I want to just say to everyone, many blessings and bye for now. To be continued. Bye-bye. Mm-hmm.